We're going to be in Jeremiah today, Jeremiah chapter 39, Jeremiah chapter 39, and uh, we are looking at verses 1 through 18 today. Charles Swindoll, in his book, Hope Again, he reflected on the 1988 Summer Olympics in South Korea, where Ben Johnson of Canada won the 100-meter dash, setting a new uh, Olympic record and a new world record. Our American contender, Carl Lewis, came in second, and most were shocked that he hadn't won the gold. After the race, the judges learned that Johnson had had an illegal substance in his body. He ran the race illegally. So the judges took away his medal. Though he ran faster and made an unforgettable impression, he didn't deserve that reward. Though the world and even our fellow Christians may be impressed with and applaud our deeds, let's not forget that God is the final judge. He searches our hearts. He alone knows our motivation, and that's why we conduct ourselves in fear. That's why we walk in reverence, because we know that he is checking For illegal substances, he knows whether deep down inside we've gotten sucked into the cosmos, whether we have bought into this world system or not. Today we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 39. Please turn with me there, Jeremiah chapter 39. Today we're coming off the heels of an exciting narrative. We've been out of uh, this study for a bit, for a couple of weeks, jumping back in, but there's been this exciting narrative that has brought us to this point today in our chapter. Jeremiah, in our last lesson, had been thrown into a pit, and he was rescued by an unlikely candidate. And so if you read Jeremiah chapters 37 through 39, you will find that those events will be in chronological order, which leads us to the end of this seventh section today. And we've titled the events of this section, The Messages and Events Before the Fall of Jerusalem. And as we will see today, Jerusalem will fall by the mighty hand of God, the sovereign hand of God. But in the middle of it, there's a great truth here for us that I believe we find in this chapter. And that truth is that God will reward, and if you don't have notes, we have notes in the back uh, to track along, but... God will reward those who are faithful to him, to his work and to his word, but he will discipline those who reject his will. We're going to see that played out today. A very basic, uh, fundamental reality for all of God's children throughout any dispensation, throughout human history. This principle is true for those who are in Christ today, and it was true for God's people in the Old Testament. And from this passage, we're going to find that there are four examples given to us here in this text of those who are rewarded or were chastised by God himself. So we're going to find individuals who are rewarded or were chastised in uh, Jeremiah chapter 39. We're going to see four examples of that today. So we're going to begin our time together. We're going to look at that first example here. That first example was King Zedekiah. Zedekiah rejected God's will and um, was chastised for his disobedience and we see that in verses 1 through 8 now the last recorded meeting that we had of jeremiah and king zedekiah took place in chapter 38 and uh, you remember what god's message was to king zedekiah right it's been a bit that message was i wanted to pull it up here for you it was in chapter 38 verses 17 and 18 God had this message to give to Jeremiah that he might give this to King Zedekiah. And the message that God wanted King Zedekiah to have was, if you will indeed go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then you will live. The city will not be burned with fire, Jerusalem, and you and your household will survive. But if you will not go out to the officers of the king of Babylon... Then this city will be given over to the hand of the Chaldeans, and they will burn it with fire, and you yourself will not escape from their hand. Pretty pretty clear, right? Pretty clear. Uh, from God's instruction here to, to King Zedekiah, God wanted him to understand that there were no gray areas. There's no middle ground to stand on or fence to walk. He was either to obey God's clear will or 
to reject that clear will. Now remember, uh, King Zedekiah, he loved to walk the middle ground. You'll remember um, he desired the approval of man from that last chapter in chapter 38. Um, He handed off Jeremiah to his officials. And as the king of Judah, he said, I have no power to help this man out, to help out Jeremiah. Um, Then in that last chapter, we also noted that he met with with, uh, Jeremiah. King Zedekiah met with Jeremiah. And he took Jeremiah, the text says, into the third entrance of the house of the Lord. So King Zedekiah, he feared man. He feared his position as king in Judah, and he feared the approval of his people, but he should have feared the living word of God. He should have feared this instruction given to him directly from Jeremiah, but this is what we read in chapter 39, so we're going to pick it up. Let's read verses 1 through 8, and this will describe for us what transpires for King Zedekiah here, verse 1, let's read together. Now when Jerusalem was captured in the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, the city wall was breached. Then all the officials of the king of Babylon came in and sat down at the middle gate, Nergal, Saretzer, Samgar, Nabu, Sar, Sakim, and Rab, Saris, Nergal, Saretzer, and the Rabmag, and the rest of the officials of the king of Babylon. When Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and all the men of war saw them, they fled and went out of the city at night by way of the king's garden through the gate between the two walls, and he went out toward Uh, toward the Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho, and they seized him and brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, at Riblah in the land of Hamath, and he passed sentence on him. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes at Riblah. The king of Babylon also slew all the nobles of Judah He then blinded Zedekiah's eyes and bound him in fetters of bronze to bring him to Babylon. The Chaldeans also burned with fire the king's palace and the houses of the people, and they broke down the walls of Jerusalem. This is a uh, sad account in the life of someone who had clearly been given the will of God. Clearly been given the will of God in chapter 38. Yeah, but if you read this account, along with 2 Kings chapter 25, I'd encourage you to write these verse references down. 2 Kings chapter 25, 2 Chronicles 36, along with Jeremiah 52, you'll read of Jerusalem's destruction, plunder, captivity, and deportation of thousands of Jewish families. But the kicker is that none of these things would have happened if King Zedekiah had humbled himself before the Lord and had surrendered himself over to King Nebuchadnezzar. His stubbornness brought this upon the people of God in chapter 38 doesn't only end with the reality of the fact that Jerusalem would be captured, but it also ends with the realization of where Jeremiah was when when Jerusalem had been captured. But where is King Zedekiah? Well, the first two verses give us the timing into this major event. Verse 1 gives us the timing for when Babylon had laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. And verse 2 tells us how long that siege had lasted. The Babylonians came against the city for 18 months until finally in 586 B.C., God allowed this city to fall into the hands of the Babylonians. And it is here that we have a list of the officials in verse 3. When the wall was broken down, they came in, and the text says that they sat down at the middle gate. And what this phrase means is that they were holding court or they were presiding as judges in a sense. It may have been that they were deciding who was going um, to live, who would die, who would go into exile, who would stay in Judah. Uh, But what is so much more important is the fact that this verse was the literal plain fulfillment of a previous prophecy given. Let me say that again. This verse is the literal, plain fulfillment of a prophecy previously given here 
in Jeremiah chapter 1. So we were in chapter 38 a couple of weeks ago. It's been some time since we were in the first chapter. I want to bring this up for you. Chapter 1, verse 15, uh, we read these words. For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord, and they will come and they will set each one his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem and against all its walls round about and against all the cities of Judah. Just notice there how precise this uh, fulfillment is. They're going to set up camp at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. And again, this is a testimony to the literal fulfillment of God's word. When God said that the Babylonians would set up their thrones at the entrance of Jerusalem, that was exactly what had happened. And when I studied the names listed here, what I found was that the officers listed in verse 3 were very powerful. For instance, you have Nergal Sheretzer, who, who was Nebuchadnezzar's son-in-law, who would become king of Babylon in 560 B.C., followed by Belshazzar seven years later, the same Belshazzar from Daniel chapter 5. So when King Zedekiah saw these powerful officials, we read in verse 4 that he humbled himself to the word of God. He humbled himself to the will of God. And he went right over to Nebuchadnezzar and surrendered, right? Chapter 4, or verse 4, what do we see there? He, it, we, we read, when Zedekiah king of Judah and all the men of war saw them, they fled. Verse 4 says they fled. So what did the king do? He flees from King uh, Nebuchadnezzar, but that wasn't the only person he was running from. For King Zedekiah, unfortunately, he is running from the very plain, very clear will of God. And as a result, he is chastised for this. There's a very important lesson here for us as believers. When we choose to run from the very clear, very plain, revealed will of God that he has given to us through his word, if we are choosing to live in sin for the passing pleasures of this world, um, then as a child of God, we will be chastised. Uh, dusty Bibles will always lead to dirty lives. I've said that before. I'm going to say that again. Dusty Bibles will always lead to dirty lives. Don't forget that point. Zedekiah was chastised for his disobedience. And before God, King Zedekiah was disobedient to his word. Now, Warren Wearsby made a good observation here. He says of this account in, in uh, Jeremiah 39, Zedekiah, his family, and his staff tried to escape, but the Babylonians caught up with them and delivered them to Nebuchadnezzar at his headquarters at Riblah, some 200 miles north of Jerusalem. There he passed judgment on all of them, and the Babylonians were not known for their tenderness. And uh, that becomes fairly obvious to us when we read verses 6 and 7 of chapter 39. In fact, in verse 7, when it states of King Zedekiah that they bound him in fetters of bronze, we might say shackles that are made out of bronze, he was chained up and hauled off to the very place he had fled from. Now, when chapter 38 ended, there was another thought that we had there. In chapter 38, when it had ended, King Zedekiah looked to be the winner, right? I mean, he was the, he was the king of a nation. But in the grand scheme of things, he's the loser. Don't forget that either. By choosing to resist God's will and by running from God's word, uh, Zedekiah lost, and the reality was Zedekiah was a loser in chapter 38. He just didn't realize it. Now, we're in a good position. We may, now, we may be in a good position today, but we are choosing, if we are choosing to set the word of God aside, we've already lost the battle. And God's hand of discipline may be around the corner for correction. Hebrews 12.10 is very clear. It begins by speaking of our earthly parents, saying this, for they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he, speaking of God, he disciplines us. Who, who is us? The believer in Christ. He disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. So the scriptures are clear. God will not sit idly by while his children choose to live in sin or to reject his word. God will discipline. He'll bring discipline into our lives for the purpose of personal growth. 
that we would, as Hebrews 12.10 says, that we may share his holiness. Psalmist in 107 uh, motivated God's people to praise God. But there's a fascinating element in that psalm. In Psalm 107, verse 10, we read, There were those who dwelt in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains. And you're probably wondering, why even focus on that one verse in isolation? I mean, you, you look at verse 1 of Psalm 107. And in verse 1, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Why focus on verse 10? Now I bring us to verse 10 because of the Jewish Targum, which was an Aramaic paraphrase explanation or interpretation of the Hebrew scriptures, suggested that verse 10 referred to King Zedekiah. And I find that fascinating. Verse 10 says that they, there were prisoners in misery and chains. And King Zedekiah certainly would fit this description by what we read here in chapter 39, verses 6 and 7. But why were there prisoners in misery and chains? Why? What was the purpose? Verse 11 goes on to say, Because they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. And that word for spurned means to look down upon or to disregard. And that was King Zedekiah. I mean, God is very clear here. He brings his word to King Zedekiah over and over again through Jeremiah. But Zedekiah just re disregards the message and, and he ends up fleeing. God gave his word to him and, he, and instead he flees in the opposite direction. And there's a note here that I want to mention, believer. If you are running from the word of God, then turn back to him today. The word, if the word of God is not a priority in your life, then make that adjustment. Make it a priority to study um, the word of God, to grow in your understanding of it, and to, and to apply it, to make life decisions, uh, life adjustments in view of it. That needs to happen. Well, that brings us to the second example in this text. We see in verses 9 through 10, the Jews submitted to God's will. The Jews who submitted to God's will were spared, verses 9 through 10. Verse 9 says, As for the rest of the people who were left in the city, the deserters who had gone over to him, and the rest of the people who remained, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, carried them into exile in Babylon. But some of the poorest people who had nothing, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, left behind in the land of Judah and gave them vineyards and fields at that time. The ones who remained in Judah were still under Babylonian control, but they were given the freedom to continue living life. It may have been that some of them remembered the messages of Jeremiah, how he had predicted the coming invasion of the Babylonians. For 40 years, his messages had been looked down upon by the religious elite as well as by the authorities, but Jeremiah remained faithful. Which brings us to the third example in this text, and that is Jeremiah. Jeremiah remains faithful to God's will and continues ministry. We see that in verses 11 through 15. And when we last left Jeremiah in chapter 38, he seemed to be the loser in life. He was misrepresented in more ways than one. He had been beaten, neglected, thrown into a muddy cistern, brought into a private meeting with the king, misunderstood, underappreciated, held captive in the court of the guardhouse, but God had his eyes on his servant. And continue to protect him, which is why I believe we read what we read here in these next few verses, 11 through 14. It says, Now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave orders about Jeremiah through Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, saying, Take him and look after him, and do nothing harmful to him, but rather deal with him just as he tells you. And note the significance of that. This is. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar saying this of Jeremiah. So Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, sent word along with Nebuchadnezzar, the Rabsaris, and Nergal Saretzer, the Rabmag, and all the leading officers of the king of Babylon. They even sent and took Jeremiah out of the court of the guardhouse and entrusted him to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shapan, to take him home. So he stayed among the people. Gedaliah will have a major role in, in the next few uh, chapters here. But while under this new leadership, God just continues to have his hand 
a blessing on Jeremiah. Um, we see that. One pastor pointed out that as God was pouring out his wrath on most, at the same time, he protected and honored those who remained faithful to him and to his word. We're going to see that in chapter 40. I love chapter 40 because we see that truth. Um, Jeremiah had a testimony, and that testimony proved to be of godliness. We don't know how Nebuchadnezzar knew of God's prophet. He may have heard about Jeremiah through those letters that were sent to the Jewish exiles in chapter 29, or King Nebuchadnezzar may have heard about Jeremiah by his own testimony. Jeremiah told the people that God's will for them was to submit to the Babylonians, perhaps after catching wind of these kinds of messages. It blessed the king of Babylon. Now, we don't know how Jeremiah had earned some sort of favor with the king, but what we do know was that the Lord was behind all of this. The Lord is behind it all. Now, Nebuzaradan was given instruction by the king to protect Jeremiah. So we read what we read in verse 1 of the next verse. Um, the word which came to Jeremiah in chapter 40. If you go to chapter 40, verse 1, it says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord after Nebuzaradan, captain of the bodyguard, had released him from Ramah, when he had taken him bound in chains among all the exiles of Jerusalem and Judah who were being exiled to Babylon. Here we have Jeremiah. He's bound in, in chains again, and uh, Nebu Nebuzaradan releases him. So how does Jeremiah end up in these chains again after the king told Nebuzaradan to watch after Jeremiah to release him? I could see someone like uh, the thinking atheist who has a website pointing readers to his apparent contradictions that are found in scripture going right here to this account to try to suggest that there is a contradiction here. Um, and I, I don't believe we have a contradiction. In order for a contradiction to happen, you have to have two events that cannot, that are impossible for them to coexist together. I don't see this as a contradiction, nor do I see any other contradiction in the scripture. I believe that the reason for this was that at the express command of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuzaradan had Jeremiah released from the court of the guard and committed him to Gedaliah, who was appointed to be governor of the cities of Judah, while the vast undertaking of transferring all the captives to Babylon was going on. Jeremiah had the liberty of mixing with the people, which is what we do see at the end of verse 14 in chapter 39. Jeremiah, no doubt, com was comforting God's people and instructing them on how they should live as captives in a strange land. And in what must have been utter confusion during those days of mass deportation, Jeremiah was not recognized by the soldiers and like the others of the crowd, he's placed in chains and he is put in the train of captives. At Ramah, he was identified by the officials and released by Nebuzaradan, which is what we do see in chapter 40, verse 1. Thus, his real freedom beginning in our next chapter. Uh, so is this an inconvenience for Jeremiah? Yes, it's an inconvenience. But these two passages do not contradict each other, which leads us into, the, into verse 15. It says, Now the word of the Lord had come to Jeremiah while he was conf uh, confined in the court of the guardhouse, saying, so his ministry continues, continues. Jeremiah doesn't have his eyes gouged out. He isn't placed in some solitary confinement. He's given a message by God that God wanted communicated to his humble servant, Abed-Melech. And that brings us to the fourth and final example that we have here in the scripture. Um, and that fourth example is Abed-Melech. Abed-Melech was rewarded for his faithfulness to God from verses 16 through 18. If you were unable to take in our last lesson, I'd encourage you to do that. As I mentioned, chapters 37 through 39 go together as a unit within this seventh section in our study. God raised up a man in our last lesson by the name of Ebed Melech to physically save God's prophet from a cistern in chapter 38. We already learned that this man had a, had a tender heart for God's prophet. And when he learned that Jeremiah had been mistreated, he actually publicly rebukes 
King Zedekiah to his face in that last chapter and was given permission to get Jeremiah out of that muddy pit. So God had something to say to Ebed-Melech. God is keeping track of these things. And he says in verse 16, Go and speak to Ebed-Melech, the Ethiopian, saying, God wanted this communicated to Ebed-Melech. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to bring my words on this city for disaster and not for prosperity, and they will take place before you on that day. In other words, God wanted him to understand that his wrath was about to be poured out on his people for their rebellion, and that Ebed Melech would see this take place with his own eyes. However, Uh, Let's continue reading here. Verse 17 says, But I will deliver you on that day, declares the Lord, and you will not be given into the hand of the men whom you dread. For I will certainly rescue you, and you will not fall by the sword, for you will have your own life as booty, because you have trusted in me, declares the Lord. The reward for Abed-Melech was the preservation of his life. Pastor Thompson made a great observation about this verse. He says that these verses are here to reiterate the fact that God will take care of his faithful people even when he is in the process of pouring out his angry wrath on his own people. And as far as I can tell, Ebed Melech will not appear in all of the rest of Scripture. He's not made mention of. He's not referred to. He is virtually absent. But by his faithfulness to the Lord, by his faithfulness to the Lord's servant, He is remembered and he is rewarded. Um, So there is a constant theme that we see when we work our way through a passage like Jeremiah chapter 39. We see God's judgment being poured out. I mean, Jerusalem has fallen. But there is a great truth here for us uh, to hang on to, and it is this, that God will reward those who are faithful to him, to his work and to his word, but he will discipline those who will reject his will. He will carry those who are faithful to him through even a time of judgment. And we're going to see that in our next lesson. Before we close our time, there are a couple of important lessons uh, that I want to take away from Jeremiah chapter 39. The first important lesson is that there are major negative consequences for failing to obey the word of God. As we saw from our first example, King Zedekiah suffered some major negative consequences instead of trusting the Lord to see him through. Verse 4 says that he flees, he fled from the Babylonians, but at the core of the issue, he flees from God's clear will given to him by Jeremiah. So many years earlier, I'm reminded of David's words that he wrote in Psalm 38 about his own sin when he stepped away from the clear will of God and pursued sin. He describes the consequences for that sin in verse 4 of chapter 38. For my iniquities are gone over my head as a heavy burden. They weigh too much for me. We don't like to acknowledge that. But there is a heavy price to pay when we fail to obey the word of God, choosing instead to pursue our own desires. Uh, The second lesson is that God is faithful to reward those who are about serving him. When you look at Jeremiah and Ebed Melech, these two guys served God in different ways. Jeremiah had the high calling to proclaim the messages that uh, that God wanted proclaimed to whoever those messages were intended for. And Ebed Melech was a man of truth and action. He spoke up when God's servant was in the cistern and took it upon himself to get him out of there. And the Lord rewards him for that. Finally, our third lesson is that God may judge a nation, but within it, reward those who are faithful to him. This is going to be a theme that runs through the next few chapters as we move into chapter 40, 41, 42, 43 even. We are going to see this clearly made. The place of safety and security is found only in fellowship with Jesus Christ. And the only way in which we can be in fellowship with Jesus Christ is by trusting in him to save us from our sin penalty. Make that decision today, if you haven't already, to trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and you will be saved. For the rest of us, I like uh, what G. Campbell Morgan wrote on this chapter in Jeremiah. Kind of a sobering Uh, reminder for each of us, I think. 
He writes this, We in our security need to be reminded that for us also there may come the 11th year and the 4th month and the 10th day of the month when God will hurl us from our place of privilege as he surely will unless we are true to him. So, we need to be faithful to him. We need to be faithful to his word. We do. doesn't matter what the times are like. It doesn't matter how good the times are. It doesn't matter how dark uh, things get in our nation. We, we need to be those who are faithful to the Lord and to his word. That is the place of safety. We're going to see that in the, in the weeks to come. Heavenly Father, we give you praise. I want to thank you for the hope that is here um, in, in, this, in a passage like this. And uh, we thank you for the great reminder that is here as well. May we be a people who are faithful to you, looking to you, and uh, looking to your word, we give you praise. In your name I pray, amen.